everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, you are watching this the live webinar by HKTDC.com sourcing. And the topic today is a really interesting topic. It's called a broad trend in supply chain and outlook 2023. So it's nearly to the, the end of 2022. So it's a time to have an outlook to see what's going on in next year. And the topics today is more about the AI and also the broad trend about the big data. Uh, previously, we talked a lot of things about uh, supply chain and sustainability to help everyone of us to have all the people join our webinars to understand what's the trend, what's the uh, sourcing trend, the supply chain, and also all the procurement things related to you from time to time. So um, this time we talk a bit more technical. So we talk about blockchain and big data. So and today we have a couple good speakers for us to share their inside talk with us about the trend coming up. So, but before that, uh, although some of you may, but some of you may not know uh, what, hktdc.com sourcing means to you. So here is a very brief introduction of us. Uh, we are Hong Kong Trade Development Council, and we have fifth, over 15 years history of doing the global trade, supporting the small and middle-sized enterprise to connect with the, uh, all the business users around the world to do the trading, to do the sourcing. And we also have over 15, offices around the world to connecting people not just in Hong Kong or in greater China, but also with people from different continents to do the business, to do the sourcing from all together. Uh, in the past few years, we all know that we are a bit disconnected. Uh, there's, so the, and we also know digital has been booming for, for Quite a long time. So in this year, we introduced a new idea of sourcing, which is called the exhibition pass. It's a brand new hybrid model that including online and offline solutions together. So you can uh, find your buyers, find your suppliers anytime, anywhere through our exhibition pass channel platform. Uh, we have our physical exhibitions over 30 a year. We have a smart business matching platform called the kick to match that you can uh, you can schedule meetings, you can find your business partner through our platform, through online and schedule a meeting and have a meeting over there. Uh, we also have a platform called the Intelligency Hub. It is an online and offline seminar and conference uh, site that you can, you can be with us offline and also you can join us out at conferences and seminars online as well. And then after our fairs, there is a continuity of that. Uh, we have our hktdc.com sourcing platform as a 24 seven hub for you to, con to do the sourcing from time to time. It's a trusted online market marketplace that you can find your buyers and suppliers through in mainland China, Asia, and in the rest of the world. We have over 200, uh, we have over 2 million buyers uh, from time to time, registered buyers. We have over 130,000 suppliers, and every year we are making over 24 million business connections to connecting the buyers and suppliers across the world. Um, we have, if you want to know more about us, just go to visit our site, uh, sourcing.hktdc.com, then you can see more about us and source what you are looking for. And we know that sometimes, apart from looking for your things, for sourcing, you want to know more about what's the sourcing trend. Today, we are talking about that through our webinar, but we also have our recording and other thought leaders articles in our website called the Lil Spice. Uh, the Lil Spice website is like a board. It's an intelligent, it's an information hub to posting most of the latest trends about sourcing and, and business over there. You can find what you want to know, if you want to hear our webinar recording or other articles from our thought leaders, just come to us to, to take a look on that. So uh, we have a lot of things there. Scan the QR code, then you will know where, where we are. And here is our URL. Um, that's a very brief introduction of our platform, but I also want to introduce one more thing in December. That is a Green Innovation Carbon Maturity, it is a Eco Expo Asia Conference uh, by HKTDC, and it will be hosted in mid-December. 14th to 17th of December. Uh, it, is a, it is a conference about uh, green economy, 
It was about eco, eco, eco friendly, eco environmental industry. Uh, it's about technology, green products, and solutions. Uh, that's organized by Hong Kong Trade Development Council, uh, Miso Fan Book, and also co organized by the Environmental, Environment and Ecology Bureau of HKSAL government. Um, we have we, previously we talked about exhibition plus, and for this Eco Expo, you can also do it online, offline. Uh, you can go to the brand new in Hong Kong during 14th to 17th. And if you are in overseas, you can also join with us through the exhibition plus platform, through the kit to match, uh, matching platform, and also the intelligence and help to get to know the latest trend about carbon neutrality, new energy, green finance, and other green initiatives. Uh, we have our startup zone and also have our Eco Asia conferences there to share the latest things and connect people about the ecosystems over here, about the eco, eco about the environmental industry over there. Okay, uh, that's a very brief introduction of what we, we are going on. So we get back to the topic today. We are very happy to have two speakers with us. We have Ivy from Fight Amigo, which is a very she has a lot of experience on the logistics and car services and how to apply ICT on the supply chain. And also we have Bertrand Chan, the CEO of Global Shipping Business Network. Uh, it is a it is independent, non-profit making technology consortium for reimagined global trade. And today we have Lewis from HKTDC Research, our principal economist. Uh, to be the facilitator and moderator of our discussion today. So today we have a couple of speakers there. So I pass the time to Luis for you to uh, help us to facilitate this speak, this uh, th this discussion today. Okay, it's your time, Luis. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Lenny. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out and joining us today for this uh, panel: blockchain in supply chain and outlook 2023. This is Louis Chen at HKDC Research, and I will be more, your moderator today. Now, everybody know that the global pandemic and the ensuing supply chain chaos have exposed the fact that the worldwide logistic industry does not have the transparency and traceability to make cross-border shipments sufficiently seamless and efficient. Most uh, global businesses have accelerated their adoption of technology to get through the pandemic and the hot heat logistics industry has similarly embraced digital technologies to improve its resilience. Now, today with me are Bertrand of GSBN and Ivy of Freak Amigo, both are pioneers spearheading digital transformation in the logistics and trade finance market. To waste no time, let me begin proceedings by posting the first questions to our panelists. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has prolonged the uh, uh, global supply chain disruptions. How far the emerging technology solutions such as blockchain, AI, and machine learning can help relieve the pain and upkeep the supply chain resilience, and more importantly, the cash flows of businesses now and going forward? Bertrand, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Luis, for, for this question. Thanks, HKDDC, for giving the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Um, yes, I think the question you raised is very uh, pertinent right now. Uh, we just went through three years of uh, COVID-19 crisis, and the least thing we can say is supply chain was disrupted. Um, now we are seeing, after three years, uh, freight rates going much higher, now dropping down much lower, and anybody's guess what happened over the next two, three years with more and more uh, supply of shipping ships hitting the, the shipping lines, right? Um, what we see actually from technology is uh, blockchain actually can help, but unfortunately, the disruption is coming from things that doesn't purely do has to do with technology. Is the supply demand? Is the market structure of the sh uh, of the, the 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 shipping industry? It's also the physical infrastructure in different location in US, for instance. Uh, where you have a certain uh, practice with terminal operator and how they uh, move goods, where you had actually very, very heavy congestion in Long Beach, for instance. And also structurally, uh, uh, physically, when you have big change in terms of demand, uh, where you have actually over ordering and now under ordering, 
you have a massive difference in flow. And that actually is something that unfortunately, even you have the best AI model and best uh, blockchain technology cannot be resolved. Um, however, what we see is hopefully next year and the next few years, we start to see normalization of uh, uh, trade flow and, and behavior. And one thing that has happened with the last three years, which is quite helpful is uh, we see a kind of big gap towards digitization, big jumps towards digitization. And actually that's the case for a lot of industry. But for shipping industry, even more. Um, I think over the last 20 years, the shipping industry tried to digitize, but they will always kind of hold back and say, why do we have to do it? But at least for two reasons now, we're seeing a lot of uh, change. So for instance, in the United States, after disruption that we see in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, at the terminal, terminal congestion, uh, you, the government start to say, hey, you need to start to report tension demurrage, you need to have more visibility to the fees, or how you charge those fees and mean better type of sharing of data. Another thing we're seeing also is uh, toward moving towards more paperless uh, uh, shipping. So I know for a lot of the audience here, uh, we don't care as much of the shipping industry, the shipping line <laughs> and the terminal operator, but something that impacts you on a daily basis. Today, you still actually use so much paper uh, uh, to, to, to proceed on, on shipment, right? And if the paper get lost and things like that, uh, that impacts your, your flow, potentially can get financing if there's some error, later credit doesn't work, it's an error, and you'll be of blading, uh, or there's delay in the delivery of the little, a bit, um, delay of, a little, a bit of blading, for your credit. And also you may have impact uh, on the environment because you have to fly around all those courier, all those bit of blading. So I think that's moving towards uh, something of the past, hopefully, uh, because as, uh, with blockchain, we can start to digitize a lot of those paper documents to be purely digital representation of them. And one example is electronic bit of lading. So I think that's quite exciting. Uh, I know the electronic bit of lading, I think exists for the last 20 years already. I think 1999 was the first time it was invented. Uh, but I think we will start really see uptick in that. That's something that'd be very exciting to see. Hopefully it can address some of the needs and some of the problems that the, 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 the community sees. Uh, thank you, Bashan. And how about you, Ivy? Can, how can your AI or machine learning empowered uh, solutions uh, can really help uh, our struggling uh, traders to take care of uh, uh, the problems regarding uh, forecast. Actually, after uh, COVID, after uh, 2020, all the traders or any stakeholders in the supply chain, they are looking for some solutions to do a better predictions and cost control so that uh, AI and machine learning applications can uh, good for the traders, good for the shippers, and even the freight forwarders and I shipping nice to do uh, the cost control on it and prediction on it. So uh, let's say the fulfillment centers and the warehouse automations right now are uh, a part of AI and in the IoT, that machines so, so that they can have a better control on the stock level and temperature control on it. And also there is forming up demand on the e-commerce market so that the fulfillment center apply AI in their warehouse to do the uh, operation cost control on it. So uh, also particular in US and UK market, they are high demand on the trucking, local trucking, but there uh, are shortage on the labor so that uh, the automations and AI also apply on their on their trucking industries to lower the cost and also to fulfill the shortage of the trucking demand for the market. Of course, um, also we also point out that there is routing shortage. The global logistic demand is uh, there is. Uh, demand and the supplies do not match. So that how do we make use of the AI to do a better transportation man management system and do a better routing to lower the shipper cost? That is uh, the platform and the SaaS platform that we can offer to the traders right now. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ivy. So, uh, given all the uh, advantages uh, you both just talked us through, how and what exactly and actually make blockchain or AI or machine learning enabled alternatives 
okay, recently available in the market, different from those which uh, have been in the market for quite a while. Uh, we're talking about real-time tracking or scheduling uh, solutions, which are already in the market for quite some time. So how uh, the latest or the cutting edge uh, technologies are being applied okay, in your services or, or in, your, in your industry that are actually helping uh, our uh, Hong Kong traders out, okay, in in the view of uh, the, the supply chain disruption, as I just mentioned, uh, the demand supply mismatches. So uh, if uh, the demand and supply uh, continues to 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 to, to, to be mismatched and mis mismatched, then then how actually the technology can have, okay, to mitigate or to kind of uh, help uh, companies to de-risk themselves. So maybe I feel you would rather go first. Actually, for why now there is some SaaS platform to do uh, some AI voting outcome. So uh, maybe let's say as example, we all think that there is the direct fight from let's say a case from China to Frankfurt. We all think that direct fight will be the fastest way to do so. But why now there is port congestion, there is shortage from the um, from the labor in the port and also the custom issue, there is some delay. Uh, all those figures we put into our algorithm to calculate. Uh, for example, there is a case in last Christmas, uh, the, a client have a good and a large cargo from China shipped to Frankfurt, but after our calculation, we found out that the fast way that is we take the air freight to Netherlands and then through the local trucking to Frankfurt. From the after we do it, and the result come out that if we make the case fast to the normal case and the common practice seven days faster than the then we take the uh, the direct flight. So and uh, so that come out the result, we save the time for our clients and also this way to saving their course and help them to do the uh, duty all night. So uh, saving the operation times to do the financing on the uh, cargo duty also. At this way, uh, the traders can have more benefits from the AI. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Ivy. Anything to add, Bajan? Okay, how um, the watching uh, enabled services are going to uh, excel, okay, or be more useful, okay, uh, compared to the existing uh, real-time tracking or scheduling solutions? I, I I think it's not exactly on the scheduling because I think scheduling is a fundamentally an optimization problem, right? And have to say that with the disruption that we're seeing, it's a, it's a, it's a miracle if you can predict anything correctly, <laughs> because a lot of things are unprecedented, right? We never seen things like that. I think for more than 60, 70 years. I mean, for the, since the beginning of shipping, I would say, um, container shipping. I mean, um, now one thing that actually blockchain, especially one example I can give in China, which actually had some impact, as you know. Um, in China, there's a big policy who push adoption of blockchain, which is the 14th uh, five-year plan, which was announced, I think, uh, in 2019, 2020, I forget exactly when. Um, but since then, actually, there's a big push towards uh, using blockchain for uh, digitizing a lot of industry. So that has some relevance, especially in terminal uh, for import in China. So the Ministry of Transport uh, in 2021 announced this uh, uh, pro project called uh, uh, Chang which means it stands for actually uh, a, a better, a clear way project to make sure the, the transportation is smooth at the imports. So what happened on that is uh, with the GSBN, we actually collaborate with shipping line and terminal operator in China. So maybe a background of GSBN, our shareholders are eight of the largest uh, uh, shipping line and terminal operator. And we have a pretty uh, strong footprint in Asia. So uh, we were able to actually deploy this solution called Cargo Release in uh, uh, most of the terminal, large terminal in China. So uh, Shanghai, Qingdao, uh, Guangzhou, Yantian, a, a lot of location. Essentially, it's a product for imports whereby the information that needs to be exchanged uh, between 
the ship agent, cargo agent, terminal, custom, everything is actually going uh, paperless uh, using uh, our platform or infrastructure to be able to verify the information and to give a visibility and full uh, 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 control of what's happening. So that actually really accelerated the, the process of imports. So you used to be two or three days to get all documents ready between the ship agents, the terminal, the customs to be able to pick up your container, right? The container the ship has arrived, the container we have to pick up, pick it up. But using this, uh, you move from a couple of days to a couple of hours. So that actually made a big, big difference. And also more recently, if you look at uh, in, in some of the city in China uh, where you had lockdown, right? So in Shanghai, for instance, in uh, uh, I think March, early this year, right? Uh, that solution made a big difference. So more than 10,000 customers uh, have been using this uh, heavily in terms of the uh, uh, NPS score is very, very high. So that's one example I would say where uh, using blockchain actually did solve some problem, you add some value. Now, again, as I said before, uh, technology cannot make miracle, right? <laughs> we, are, we are seeing in present time, it's really hard to, 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 uh, to solve all the problems that we can see, but we see good, good use cases actually popping up. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Bertrand. Grant. So uh, another question that, uh, that would also uh, be very uh, much a headache to our trader is talking about the cash, uh, the cash flow problem. So uh, supply chain disruption uh, not just means uh, disruption about uh, the cargo movement, but also cash flows. So uh, some said that uh, the global trade finance gap is estimated to reach uh, uh, 2.5 trillion US dollars unless technology is properly the, uh, adopted to cut through the complexity and silos between uh, supply chains. So how um, technology or technology enabled uh, trade finance uh, products are going to turn the tide? Again, okay, how do you see that uh, the new uh, or innovative uh, trade finance products are going to be different uh, from the typical trade finance products? So Bertrand, would you like to share with us uh, some more regarding GSBN's uh, trade finance initiatives? Sure, sure. So I, I think, as I said earlier, right, um, uh, trade finance actually is really important. Um, I think uh, global trade is around 20 trillion, uh, 20, 29 trillion. Um, a lot of the financing is required to allow all those uh, 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 company to be able to produce and to ship all those goods to manage the, the, the working capital, right? And historically, there's two forms of uh, trade finance that exist. One is what we call documentary credit, which is typically a letter of credit, and the other form is called open accounts. So in both form, um, typically what's required is data, right? Uh, the bank need data to make better decisions, and effectively. In terms of letter credit, they use something called the letter, uh, the the bill of lading. So I mentioned earlier, uh, right now within blockchain, we can digitize the bill of lading. We can switch to a completely paperless version. So instead of actually waiting for a, a long time uh, to receive uh, the the bill of lading, you can get it like within really really fast, and you don't have to worry about mistake. Uh, you can amend quickly. Uh, and you don't have a case of misdelivery, right? Because sometimes if the paper is not there, they use LOI, it's, it's bad. So that's one thing that's actually really good help for trade finance because the process is faster and also more reliable. In the case of open account, it's I think really where you see the, the trade financing gap. And typically trade financing gap is because a lot of those uh, SMEs do not have enough uh, information uh, for the bank to make a, a decision. In that situation, actually, where we're helping is more for data sharing. So uh, the shipping line, the terminal has actually a lot of historical information about uh, the shipment of uh, the customer, right? They actually have a lot of information. And, but in the past, they never share this information because this information is confidential and they should not be sharing that to random people, right? It's the it's confidential information, it's a very sensitive information. Uh, however, a lot of the bank has this kind of uh, demand for it because if they can have some of the uh, the shipping information, they can make better decision. They can, first off, put credit, make them, do I extend a loan or don't, don't I extend a loan? Is this shipment genuine? Is, sorry, is it is financing need linking to a real transaction or not? They can make that decision. The second thing also is um, they can use potentially past shipment to build a credit model. So if they don't see as many uh, financial transactions, let's say, but they see how, how, how often do you ship, they potentially can make a better decision. But the key thing here is about data sharing, right? So number one, you need to share the data from the shipping line to the bank. 
for specific transaction, specific customer. But at the same time, this sharing has to be legal, meaning that the shipper has to authorize it. So one thing that we 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 would build and we resolved in uh, GSBM is this consent mechanism. How can you make sure that the shipping line is indeed able to share? And the way we do that is we build this consent app that has been tested in Hong Kong with Hapagloid, the shipping line. Uh, uh, actually, a, a Hong Kong company called AW Fruit and Bank of China Hong Kong. So within 20 minutes, they can trigger the consent. Hapagloid received the consent uh, 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 from AW Fruit, so it's ability to share the Bank of China. They retrieve the bit of lading and they send the bit of lading digitally to uh, Bank of China Hong Kong. Bank of China Hong Kong can trust the data because it comes directly from the shipping line. They don't have to worry it's a fig. And also the data is uh, structured, it's a top piece of paper. So you don't need someone, human being, to go and uh, key in, enter the thing or, or do some checking. So I think that's actually a, a massive uh, change uh, compared to the traditional way of using paper, using a uh, labor-intensive way to check those information. Obviously, we're still at the beginning of the journey. Uh, the main thing is these two industries that need to work together. The shipping line needs to be able to say, okay, so we need to adopt this consent-based mechanism. We can send the data to the bank. Bank needs also to understand, I'm receiving new type of data that can help me ascertain the risk, and I need to build the right operation to use data to extend the loan. So we are in this journey to move, move towards a much more data-driven trade finance, and we've seen a lot of good feedback in the banks. Okay, thank you very much, Bertrand. And how about you, Ivy? How Freak Amigo is using technology to help your clients optimize the management of working capital and liquidity in their supply chain? Actually, uh, just like Bertrand's sharing, um, for the point of view, how to improve the cash flow for the MSME, it might be have a core relationship with the logistic fold, that means the cargo fold and the information fold. How we can digitalize those two parts and then from this point of view, we digitize all the logistic fold and information fold, it will make easy and for the bank and financial institutes to do the financing for the SME to on the release their cash flow for them. So that uh, from our role, Fire Amigo, that is, we do the digitization on the shipment documents and all make it as a trust status to the financial institution to reveal as what we sharing, do the, uh, the technology to make it easier for the traders to apply the trade finance. And the financial institutions can get the dynamic data on the logistic record so that they no more just depends on the uh, annual report, though those may be past history to do the risk management. Why right now they can use the dynamic data, which is uh, what the traders really do the trading parties, the let's say for the cargo value and uh, uh, what kind of the uh, cargo inside, really in it, on the, their uh, origins and destinations, those informations, and all on the trust environment, so that um, no matters the traders, no matters the buyers, and the financial institutions can easily get those information and do the decisions on the trade finance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Ivy. So, uh... When it when it comes to data, when it comes to trade finance, uh, when it comes to money, then uh, things can get really complex. And uh, as much as uh, the modern supply chain, especially when it comes to uh, international trade, different countries and economies usually have their own customs uh, procedures and documentation requirements. And it is not uncommon to have uh, trade conflicts or different uh, compliance problems. So to, from your experience, uh, how bad technologies can really take or are taking care of these potential problems, especially when there are lots of uh, sensitive data, okay, moving here and there throughout the supply chain. So anything from your IV? Actually, um, for the custom, and um, also the, uh, for example, the dangerous goods, how to handle it for the carriers. Also, um, 
we why now we can apply it in the industry we can do some uh, digital scanning on it and also so, the digitalize on the documentations and also do the predictions on the traders' patterns to to do some uh, risk management on their data. Is it true? Uh, how many percentage they are providing that is true? And also uh, how to forecast the to calculate maybe let's say to calculate the cargo value. Is this uh, really 100% that is uh, to the volume and what they uh, declare, so that uh, we do some calculation on it and prediction on it to to uh, to recommend the traders how to handle uh, the custom in the good way and also uh, for based on their ex uh, trade record we can uh, calculate their declaration how. The, the trust level on the declarations. Mm -hmm. All right, Patron, anything to add? Yeah, um, I think the, the, the trade, as you said, right, it's, it's, it's quite complex and it's very different, different region, operationally is different. Forget about customs, operationally, the terminal, the shipping and how to operate also is very different, right? So, the way we try to address it at GSBN is we try to provide uh, our blockchain network as a sort of an infrastructure, common infrastructure. The data schema, to the extent we can, we try to standardize it. However, when you start to apply those products in different locations, you have to be cognizant that they have different solutions, different way to do things, the process are different, right? I need to partner with different entity in every location. In some short, we have to say you have to localize. Um, and you can actually see the same for the technology vendor, right? So if someone does a custom declaration, some country typically they have kind of a monopoly. And then what happens if technology companies such as let's say uh, Cargo Wise, Wise Tech, right? Just go buy up all of those different declaration uh, system and then they have sort of a monopoly, right? So this kind of play you see, it's, it's quite common. Um, the way we work right now is we try to partner in every location with where we think the local community that people are using because we see the blockchain as kind of the intermediary to exchange information in the most uh, efficient manner. Also, uh, the more compliant to the regulation. So one thing you may uh, not be aware is uh, there are now more and more new data regulation around data uh, exchange between different locations. So for very simply, uh, if you have data in China, can you send data outside of China or not? Uh, if you have data in uh, some, some other country in Europe, can you leave Europe? Right, so I think people are very conscious with GDPR privacy law, but data business data actually now become more and more uh, critical. So, for instance, uh, if you have data from terminal in China, you cannot leave China. It has to actually remain uh, in China because the data is considered critical infrastructure data. And for custom, for other things, it's, it's similar. So the way we see it right now is more and more people want to build solutions that address uh, their needs in different location with different jurisdiction, which different regime. But at the same time, you need this kind of common infrastructure. Uh, if you will, it's like the, the, the bottom layer to be able to allow those transmission and people can trust that that's being changed and it's compliant with the regulation. So that's one problem that we try to address. Uh, address the issue of all the different locations, it's, it's impossible. It's not one company can do it, right? So every location, and then that's why you have so many trade forward to help uh, the, 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 the customer, uh, the buyer seller to handle this, right? That's why there's a job for, for them for so many trade forwarders. Because location based, you have different ways to do things. But hopefully, with our technology as a as a bottom layer, uh, we can actually make the the data components be as nice as possible. That that's our goal. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bertrand. So the value proposition you you, you two just uh, shared sounds very enticing, but how actually? Uh, are these uh, technologies uh, accessible and applicable, okay, to uh, SMEs? Okay, I, I already I, I already see some uh, questions uh, from the audience saying that okay, we we, we, we would like to use more technologies so to optimize and and to make uh, our operation easy, but uh, it seems that uh, not everybody okay in the supply chain or maybe some uh, uh, freight forwarders okay they are uh, pretty reluctant to change. Uh, their stay quote. Um, 
how do you see, uh, how do you rate uh, the readiness and receptiveness uh, of Hong Kong uh, uh, logistics uh, service provider and also uh, SMEs, okay, in uh, the adoption of technologies? So maybe this time, Ivy, okay, you want to share your experience first? Actually, from uh, some research already, so that uh, right now there is not much adaptions uh, on technologies or AI in logistic or even supply chain. There is around 10 percent, and next five years it will come up to 60 percent. But uh, the difficulties or challenge that the top management that is facing is the average cost on uh, investing on AI or technologies that is around 1.5 million USD every year. Um, so that um, they are hesitation to move uh, to, to how to transform the data. Um, also, there is shortage of the technology uh, IT uh, talent in Hong Kong or even in other country. So uh, come out that some solution that is they are looking for some SaaS platforms to help them to lower the operation costs and transformation costs. And so not even not even the supply chain areas, even uh, any other industry, there are some SaaS platform to to help the uh, traditional players to transform. Uh, their their operations in more digital ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you, Ivy. And how about you? Okay, how how do you see that uh, uh, the way forward, Bertrand? Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, yeah. Ivy, you want uh, to say okay. something? No, no, no. Sorry, excuse me. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, adoption of technology is it's a it's big question, right? I think um, not only on logistics, uh, if you get technology for many, many, let's say, traditional industry, right? It's big roadblock. Uh, people tend to still prefer to use uh, Excel spreadsheets to, <laughs> to make prediction, uh, to use email or phone call uh, instead of using a web browser to, or platform to do things, right? It's just it's human nature and the, the, the change takes time. Um, and I think Ivy rightly point out, cost is also a, a, a consideration, right? For some SMEs who potentially doesn't have a big IT budget, and also maybe don't have enough flow to justify switching technology to a new technology, especially that you don't necessarily know what to do. So for GSBN perspective, uh, all main targets, unfortunately, are not uh, the SMEs. <laughs> we are working in partner mainly with the shipping line and terminal to enable them to do more uh, uh, interesting stuff to do to change the process to make it better to data, data exchange. However, with now we are moving towards more and more offering some solution that they can potentially access directly uh, through web browser. And most of the solution we're looking to do web browser uh, in terms of cost, we try to make it as uh, 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 as easy as possible to adapt. However, the problem to do those web browser is they don't have the same guarantee in terms of privacy. Uh, uh, encryption that like a large shipping that will get because in that environment the data is very secure it's everything's encrypted we cannot see anything and if you have to use a SaaS solution you have to make trade-off on on security of the data it's just but there's no way you, you go around that right so for SMEs they can start to adopt some solution like this where we can potentially offer easier to do portal and we have a couple projects that's uh, rolling out uh, towards the end of this year early next year so I can don't want to share now because they're not ready yet uh, but they will, will come out directly for the, the end user. Uh, one product that uh, I can share though is electron bill of lading. So this one is uh, already uh, uh, ready to go. Uh, for electron bill of lading, the biggest hurdle is you need to get um, uh, uh, insured by uh, the insurance company. Uh, you need to pass uh, an approval by the international group of PNI club, uh, which actually is a club of 13 group of uh, insurers uh, I think the, the head one is in, in London, and they have to say that this solution is a, is will be able to insure. We can insure a, a, a cargo using this uh, this electronic bill of lading. So now we actually have a, a acquire. So we have, we've been certified, sorry, uh, and that solution uh, shipper can start to use it. So you just have to ask your shipping line who supports right now, uh, Costco shipping line, double OCL, uh, CU lines. I use this solution. So you can already start to ask your customers, hey, I want to check, can I use H20 bit of lading? Uh, and, and that's, a, I think that'll make a difference. Uh, we're hoping to provide more and more uh, suitable pro um, 
product like this, the SMEs can potentially use. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bashan. So um, uh, just one or two more questions before we go to uh, the Q&A. So uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, buzzwords uh, are getting a workout. So one of them concerns uh, ESG or sustainability. So uh, issues uh, regarding carbon uh, emission reductions uh, and other climate change mitigation uh, measures are increasingly becoming important factors affecting uh, business decisions, in, uh, including the choice of logistics, uh, mall and partners. So my question is uh, how technologies can be applied to address these uh, fast emerging ESG demands? So what do you think, Ivy? Actually, uh, it's not. Honestly, it's not easy for SMG to do uh, or invest uh, the hardware to improve their uh, to do to fit the S ESG those factors. Uh, that is the what the concern on the them is uh, the investment and the return. Yeah. So uh, actually, last week I also have a, a business trip to Europe and I really. I met with the uh, Germany, those uh, SME, they also feedback that they, even the uh, country, the government, very concerned on the ESG, but how to do so. It's not easy to do so. Uh, so that um, from AI perspective, um, no matters of, let's say in the logistic way, uh, we do some calculations for the users, uh, how, to make them easier to pick, to pick the green logistic routing or green logistic solutions. In this kind of way for them to uh, to get to fit the ESG factors when they do the purchasing on their logistic. So it is more easy for them to fulfill the ESG uh, from the government or the any point of view to meet the ESG that part, and so uh, we introduce and we have some exchange for uh, with the uh, the local team, and this is quite interesting for them. And we find that the SMEs is uh, quite welcome to this kind of uh, green logistic uh, in their purchasing. Okay. Okay. How about you, Bershan? Do you see that um, blockchain has a role to play regarding ESG? Um, yeah, I think ESG is a very hot topic right now, right? Um, and uh, to some degree, people even react when they get TV. Say, actually, there's a lot of what they call greenwashing, where people they actually, especially on the finance side, they say, "Oh, this is a green bond," but in the end, the company doesn't do anything green, uh, just to claim some discount on the borrowing rate, right? So I think where one location blockchain can potentially help and actually that's not really on the current roadmap right it's just uh, if if blockchain has to be used <laughs> the way i see it is we can use that as a ledger to keep track of uh, um, behavior effectively so mm -hmm. if you want to capture uh, the the ship uh, on which certain goods has been moved you want to capture some information what they call i think scope three uh, about your suppliers and the supplier of the suppliers blockchain is actually a pretty good uh, 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 technology to use to capture this information so that uh, later on you can have an external vendor like uh, those consultants who can ascertain the footprint of a company and, as, uh, and issue a report and the report is actually backed by real data not just some certificate that they have uh, somewhere <laughs> that they've collected themselves which you don't know if it's true or not true so that's one aspect blockchain can help but obviously um, in order for that is we I think have to do more work to, to do to, towards this. Other time what you see blockchain has been applied has been for carbon credits, but this one is more trading for companies, right? But for logistics, if you want to really, uh, in my opinion, bridge the ESG, it's about having a common platform to capture this information so that someone else can come and verify and do a calculation. And the calculation may change over time, right? You will get smarter about how to measure the impact. And maybe right now we're not very sophisticated, but maybe in five years, we know much better what are the important uh, parameters to take into account. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Bachan. I think it's now time to open up the panel to your questions. 
So just in case uh, you have not yet submitted one, please do so as soon as possible using the questions button. <clears throat> so I got the first question, which I think is a uh, very much a uh, follow-up question uh, for Bertrand. So uh, this question is, um, does uh, blockchain technology in supply chain application require extra computer uh, energy consumption? Okay, in that regard, will it affect uh, a company's uh, ESG compliance? Oh, uh, no. Uh, the, answer, the short answer is no. It's, uh, so definitely you will, if you run a network, we have to spend uh, energy, right? Because you're running computer. But I think the difference is it's not Bitcoin, right? So there's no, uh, uh, the concept of proof of work where you spend energy to secure the network. So uh, blockchain, and I think what we have is enterprise blockchain, the, 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 the security is not around spending energy, rather is um, a group of trusted nodes between the stakeholder we have who ensure that there is a consensus of what's the reality, what's the agreement, what has happened in the world. And then if you agree on certain facts, it cannot be changed later on. That's the concept that's uh, used uh, in enterprise blockchain like GSTN. Uh, so definitely uh, energy would not be overly expanded. To some degree, you can think, think of is, uh, right now we think that paper BL has actually very bad, uh, paper BL rating, sorry, has very bad inf uh, in, uh, impact on the environment. Not because you have to kill trees and print paper, but you have to fly this paper all over the place and you spend a lot of energy on the plane uh, to have this courier, right? Uh, if you switch that to an electronic bit of lading, even if you spend some energy, uh, compute, computing energy to do it, uh, the impact is like 10,000 times less uh, less consuming than actually flying them. So it definitely energy is not concerned there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the next question is for both Ithi and uh, Bertrand. And uh, the, uh, our friend would like to know, okay, how exactly, okay, or by how much, okay, or, uh, the blockchain technology could really have uh, SMEs. And I think this uh, this friend would like to know more in terms of the cost of adopting uh, all those uh, uh, interesting technology uh, into their uh, business operations. Uh, for instance, uh, maybe you can share a little bit more about, uh, for example, uh, the onboarding course, uh, if they are really uh, interested in, uh, if they are really into uh, embedding uh, your interesting uh, technology solutions, okay, uh, into their supply chain uh, operations. Uh, maybe this time I give some time for Bertrand for, for a sip of water. So I think, okay, can you share with us, okay, some uh, more um, details regarding the price of the services. Uh, for me, from my point of view, uh, to onboarding the, any technologies for the, uh, let's say for this topic that is the blockchain in your supply chain or, or in your operation for uh, the first come out that is you need to build up your your teleco teams as it's not easy and it's costly and also the cow the cow computer right all your uh why now all your data is is it really ready to the digital world and so that then later on you can adopt in the ai or in the uh the blockchain that's all the islands connection together um it's from for us, and I found that in some corporate clients, um, they it's also a lot easy to do so. Uh, so that they ask for some, as I sharing, they ask for some SaaS platform or asking us to do uh, to do some private cloud or private chain for them. Um, as I already shares, uh, the basic the cost estimate that is at least over. 1.5 million per year uh, in USD. Yeah. So that um, as in other ways, uh, so the clients or the traders they will uh, looking for some solutions that is is it uh, even they build up the blockchain. How do they really to build all the related island all together? Yes, that is the point. Uh, how we do so, and is it use? Uh, is it really fit for your company to do your own board trade? Yeah. So how about you, Bashan? So, 
Yeah, I, I think I think Ivy is very correct in the sense that if you really want to build blockchain, it'd be very expensive, <laughs> and I would recommend it. <laughs> uh, you probably don't have the the technical team to maintain it, and for SME, it makes zero sense for you to try to build blockchain. Now, I think the question originally is if you were to adopt a blockchain solution, uh, what is the let's say the operating cost or the capital expenditure you may have to make? And again, mm -hmm. the answer to that is you probably do not want to do that unless you're a large organization. Large organization. What I mean by that for GSBN is if you want to access directly on network using uh, what we call a gateway, um, there's a cost to that. I don't want to share this um, public information, but there, there is an annual cost for that, and it's significant. For SME, I don't think you want to do that. It, it's not $1 million, but, but it's not $0 either, right? So there's a cost because you have some provision on the cloud. And the way we do that actually is uh, we have different service offering depending on different country you are. So if you're in Europe, you can use Azure, for instance. If you're in China, you can use AliCloud, right? Because we're not depending, we don't work with only one vendor. It's mm -hmm. going with, with vendor agnostic. So there's obviously some 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 uh, cost on that basis. Uh, but I like to go back for SME. Uh, we actually most of the time the the the, the solution the the SME will benefit directly without knowing that there's blockchain behind it. So if you go back to the example I mentioned earlier of cargo release in Shanghai or in, in China, let's say, right? What happened is the shipping line actually is picking up the tab. They are paying uh, for the infrastructure. They're paying for the data transmission. And the unit cost per uh, shipment is uh, less than $1. So if you think about it, it's not that expensive. And maybe you say, oh, well, they made enough money the last two years. They can afford to pay <laughs> $1 for this extra digital version, right? But the way we see it is actually they provide that benefit directly back to their customer because of better user experience. In the case of uh, electronic bill of lading, again, there's a unit cost. There will be a unit cost. But I think it's uh, significantly uh, cheaper, uh, the unit cost at least than the paper uh, that you have to do. The, but then the question is, every shipping have their own strategy and how much they want to charge the customer, which is not really uh, in our control, right? We are uh, infrastructure, we provide the infrastructure for people to do. So my recommendation for SMEs, the question comes from SMEs, you, you do not need to integrate with blockchain. You can uh, either uh, uh, select to ship with certain shipping and who use this kind of technology where they can provide added benefits for faster release, let's say in China. So uh, most of the shipping on, on our network, they can do that very easily in China. Uh, or uh, you use some electronic bill of lading or solution that's enabled because those vendors are on uh, uh, GSBN. Now, the next year, everybody started this year, we are onboarding more and more what we call a solution provider or application builder. So uh, recently we've uh, strike a partnership with Project 44, which is uh, one of the largest I think, visibility platform operator in the world, right? So I think they have a very dominant position in the United States. Uh, they also growing quite quite heavily, I think, in uh, Europe, in Asia. So the, the purpose of those, those uh, collaboration is we want to actually have easier, easier touch point with end customer. You don't need to know there's GSP and blockchain behind it, but uh, because they are connected with us, they're connected to our shipping and our terminal, then this, the, in our network, then this kind of information starts to transmit better, you have indirect benefits. Um, then the other thing obviously is with the banks. The data chain with the banks, you can potentially have much faster approval for your, your trade finance need, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, the last thing we're thinking now more and more is the words, if we can actually work with a, a company who are typically freight forwarder, who in the past may have to maintain our EDI connection with shipping and iron terminal, they actually maybe it's better for them to go through GSDN. Now, we don't think everything should be using blockchain because that would be a mistake. <laughs> blockchain has a lot of, uh, actually, up, uh, uh, I would say, a, a, a burden to, to maintain. It's not, it's not something that's that like to use, but for certain type of transmission between the party, blockchain is the right solution. Uh, and, and that actually will really fast track and. Uh, lower the cost, the coordination between many, many people. So I think on that aspect, what will happen for a lot of SME is you do not directly need to connect the blockchain, but you need to ensure that the service provider you work with have a strategy and how to fully utilize the new type of connection they can do uh, with GSPN or other blockchain network, right? So do they have a digitization strategy? And they do need to have that because what will happen is if, if they connect it to our network, you have a cargo release within like two hours in that three days. So which one you prefer, right? So that that that's actually the the, the net impact. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I I keep uh, seeing questions coming up. Okay, to ask uh, for uh, your prediction 
or your your uh, uh, best estimate of uh, what is going to be like okay for 2023 so uh just before we close this section may i first invite uh, ivy and then Bertrand to wrap up uh, the discussion by sharing your thoughts on the leading trends okay both uh, technology related or not technology related for the logistics sectors in 2023 so ivy over to you uh, for our predictions and our mechanism to calculate it uh we forecast it. we although that right now the supply is uh, quite full in Europe, European country, the stock is quite high level right now. So that the the logist, logistic demand from east to the west that is quite slow. Even the Christmas or New Year's is coming. So the uh, the fixed charge will not uh, have a large increase on on it before 2023 uh, Q1. So that, um, and, but uh, there is, uh, we, we can see that in the market, there is high demand on transforming the logistic data or even how to do a better routing planning in the upcoming years and the forecast on the fictage so that, um, no, not even the big corporate and SME would like to have more information on that. So uh, as a SaaS platform like us, we can provide the free information and the dashboard for them to easily to manage their, their cargo fold and even the planning throughout all the years, how to manage their uh, transportation easily. And so we also, can see that um, from the upcoming years, um, the trend is uh, more and more the e-commerce would like to distribute their goods and cargoes all over the world, not only focus on the European country or the, the, the hot country that we are reselling right now. So that even in the India or even in some uh, unserved Southeast Asia's market, we, we can see that China and the Hong Kong players also developing this kind of market right now. So um, it's not, as we have already dis discussed, uh, it's not easy to handle the custom over this uh, new country, new market. So um, some blockchain and AI, some SaaS platforms could help those traders can easily to handle stuff those bulk orders and easy to handle the custom information, no more delayed, and so to saving their trading costs and to con to uh, move their cargo easy and on time and make sure their cash flow in a healthy status. Yeah. Thank you, Ivy, and you, Bashan. Okay, your crystal ball for 2023, please. Um, I predict freight rate will be lower. <laughs> now, <laughs> joke apart, I, I think uh, the, historically the, the, the rate has been really high and I think with the going towards normalization and what happens is the shipping line uh, are actually uh, moving towards a more, we need to compete in service, right? The service before was uh, pretty horrendous in terms of on time. And now we're moving, I think, more towards a normalization. But at the same time for maybe the audience today, um, the demand also is becoming much weaker. Right, so so it's a it's a much much tougher business environment uh, now. For my prediction, the technology adoption, I'm actually quite bullish. I'm quite optimistic because I think the trend that was unleashed by the over the last two years, we're moving more and more towards a paperless uh, 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 trade, and you see a lot of new uh, re like even legislatively like regulation. So in UK, you are the UK Parliament's going to pass. Um, new regulation where you can actually can use uh, electronic records in some paper uh, records for global trade. Uh, so that's actually a big, big, big push towards moving uh, towards paperless trade. And why paperless trade is important, I view that as a first step to fully digitize a lot of the process. You don't need paper. You don't need to make phone call. You need to send email. <laughs> because once those process become electronics, uh, with or without blockchain, that suddenly the operation will become much, much easier. You'll be able to collect more data, uh, make better prediction, uh, you can handle the exception much better. Right now, everything is still very manual, very analog. 
my prediction, maybe not just for 2023, uh, is for the next five years. I think we'll we'll move from something where paper is still dominant to a world probably paper is much, much less uh, uh, important. So what does that mean for the SMEs? Is uh, you shouldn't wait. <laughs> you shouldn't be saying, no, that I've been doing IZ paper for the last, whatever, 30, 40 years. Actually, you're gonna you start to use much more electronic. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, uh, go to the cloud or use blockchain. It's just that you need to be open to certain process change that your your service provider will bring to you. They say, hey, do you want to still use those traditional way or are you okay to use something? Go online, go on the website, go on your phone, mobile to, to, to trigger those. And you should be comfortable to try that and not say, no, 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 it has to be paper because that's what I'm used to. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, everybody has to make the change. But if anything, I think what you've seen over the last three years during COVID-19 uh, crisis is if push comes to shove, people can change. It's very painful for the people can change. And I think that's what we're going to see for the next five years. Right. Thank you very much. Right. I think we have covered most, if not all, the most important issues. Certainly all we have time for. What a wonderful panel and what a thought-provoking discussion session. Please join me in thanking our panelists, Ivy and Bishan. Much appreciated. I would like to thank everyone who joined us today. I hope you all find it as rewarding as I did, and I look forward to welcoming you all back at some point in the very near future. And that's goodbye from me for this time around. Have a very beautiful evening. Bye-bye. Over to you, Lenny. Thank you, thanks a lot. Thanks for the speaker today, thanks IP and Petra. And also thank you for Louis to have us to uh, facilitate this uh, panel today. Um, the, today we have a lot of things about the blockchain, and uh, we also see there are a lot of questions that haven't. Th th there's still many questions for we need. So we will keep it, and then we will share with the guests today, and we and to talk about and more to explain more about that, and we will publish it in our Lewis by website later on. So and apart from going to the Lewis by website. Uh, we also push, publish them in link, our LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and WeCat. Just stay with us, scan it, and follow now. And last, and the one thing more is remember to visit our hktdc.com sourcing website to start your sourcing journey with us. Okay, thanks a lot for today's speakers. Thanks a lot for them. And good evening and good, and good day for all of you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.